Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we are interviewing the wonderful Vlad Costea. And Vlad, before I ask how you're doing, uh, I'll give you a very quick intro of you to our audience. Uh, please feel free to correct me or do a better one. Uh, so Vlad is a uh, Bitcoiner, writer, historian, um, and the man behind the Bitcoin Takeover podcast and website. Uh, how are you doing today? How's things going? Well, that was very correct. And I'm happy that you didn't mention my previous affiliations. Like there was a time when somebody wanted to interview me and was like, can we say that you used to write for Bitcoin magazine in the description? And I was like, uh, you know, I hate it just because I, that was like almost two years ago. So it's like I haven't done anything interesting in the meantime. So I very much appreciate that you presented me as someone who does stuff, still does stuff on his own project. And it's really exciting, you know? I'd be really interested like to kind of, often what I like to do with the with the podcast is like trying to go to the beginning of like your sort of life when it comes to Bitcoin, right? So like I wondered, um, simple question really, how did you um, come across Bitcoin in the first place? And what was it about it that actually kind of appealed to you and spoke to you? Because differs from person to person, right? I remember reading about it in 2012, 2013. And I thought that's stupid. Like, how does any of this make sense? Why should I care about this kind of money? I have my credit card, I can buy virtually anything, it can get converted. You know, the local currency can get converted automatically by the bank into any international currency. So why does any of this make sense? And then I get again, I was like 2021 20, at the time, I had no education in economics. I had no education in, you know, money censorship and getting canceled. And I suppose that what I needed in time was to get as many experiences and understand that just because I'm doing very well and I can basically participate in the global economy however I want, it doesn't mean that it's the ideal way for myself. And it doesn't mean that the rest of the world is just as privileged. So... I think I got in 2017 for the number go up aspect, even though I was very much interested in 2015 when I did a project at the university and I made a presentation about Bitcoin. And then I wanted to buy in 2016 when I was interested in writing my thesis about internet governance. And I was looking on dark web website just to see what's there and what's going on. And I didn't get into Bitcoin in 2016 because there was this blog post by Mike Hearn at the time who rage quit. He was one of the main developers and he went to some of the mainstream media publications and started talking trash about Bitcoin and said that it doesn't scale. It's a failed project. We should not pay attention to it anymore. At the time also the price crashed. And when I read that and I was still in my you know, university days when I thought that just because it's the Wall Street Journal, then it's a reliable source. I did not get into Bitcoin. So it took me three attempts to actually get it right and understand why this exists and why this has a long term sustainability. And it's going to be around in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. It might even outlive us. And that's the moment when it actually made sense to me when I realized, OK, this is truly a decentralized project. And I feel a bit ashamed that in the beginning, I was more attracted to Ethereum just because it was saying all the nice stuff that I was expecting to hear and all the stuff that I could ever dream of, only to turn out that it's an unscalable clusterfuck, which uh, can I swear on this show? I don't know. Sorry. Feel free. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I was disillusioned with Ethereum early on after I figured out that it you know, something like CryptoKitties can basically clog the blockchain. So you're supposed to have unstoppable applications, but someone is going to vet your application and decide, you know, this should not be around. So there is this social layer of discouragement, which says that you should do something or you should not do it because it's not useful, even if they say it's decentralized. And if it's permissionless and decentralized, then it needs to scale. And if it needs to scale, in the current design, it needs a lot of storage. So Ethereum is just doomed, if you ask me. It, it exists because it's useful for some projects like stable coins and stuff, 
but I don't see it succeeding just like Bitcoin because I'm proud of the community that we accomplished in 2017 when I was still a newbie. I was not running a node actually, but the node runners managed to activate SegWit. And that was a very long debate, which started, I think, in 2015. And the miners were supposed to activate themselves SegWit, just like they did with Taproot a month ago. And they did not signal at the right time. And it was the perfect storm. It was the perfect coordination. And it proved that no entity, regardless of how wealthy or how influential, is in charge or in control of Bitcoin. You can just have users organize themselves and do the exact opposite with their nodes of what the miners are doing and take control and take their power back, which I think is unprecedented for any project and is the reason why I'm bullish long-term on this project. And bullish, not necessarily just in terms of fiat money appreciation, but in terms of the success of the project and the way that it expands and it scales, not just at the network level, but also at the social level. Vlad, you just mentioned Taproot. Uh, I wanted to know, are you optimistic about Taproot being added to Bitcoin? Yeah, very much. Like, you can be conservative and say that it might be too early to update your node client and stuff like that, to which I can agree. But at the same time, it's it's been reviewed and it's been tested for at least one year. And you have had the code out there for a while. And what it does very well is to make transactions more efficient and more private. That's the whole point of it. And I like this whole idea that instead of scaling by increasing the block size, we're actually decreasing the size of transactions. So instead of making the blocks bigger to fit more transactions of the same design with the same signatures, we're actually making the signatures smaller. So you put more of them in the same existing blocks, which I think is more of an elegant design and something that we need more of as opposed to thinking or blindly believing that something like Moore's law is going to help us scale and taking out normal users from this self-validation process, which is so essential for the decentralization of the project. So something which your first answer kind of brought up for me, and sorry to kind of go back again a little bit, but um, obviously, but as you said, like you know, getting to Ethereum first, uh, there's no shame, you know, I got into double coins first. Um, but um, yeah, you said, you said obviously that you weren't that into like, or you hadn't been that educated in like the economic side of things. Um, and I, I wondered, I guess, um, so obviously you're from Romania, right? And obviously there's a, there's history of like inflation in Romania from my understanding um, and also like other sort of financial issues. Um, so I guess like, what was it or what was it that kind of got you into the economic side of things and like the understanding of central banking and the understanding of inflation and, and things like that? Was that something that came after Bitcoin in 2017 or was that something that came before that? And then you kind of saw Bitcoin and were like, oh, okay. Yeah, which way around was it, I guess, that, that kind of got you to, to think about that side of things? I always tell the story about my parents who had their wedding in 1989. Just, I think it was one month before the Romanian revolution, which overthrew communism. And they raised a lot of money at the wedding because that's the tradition that the parents and the friends, everyone gives them money to start a new life. And they put that money aside, hoping that they would be able to start a new life and buy a car. That was their goal at the time. And in communism, if you wanted to buy a car, you had to deposit the money in the government's account and then wait for one year for your car to get delivered. That was kind of the standard way of buying a car. There was a monopoly of the state and there was only one type of car that you could buy. So it's kind of terrible. But what happened then was that the revolution came and the regime got thrown away, which meant that the previous establishments were kind of dubious. You had no idea if the arrangements were still going to happen or if you're going to settle that transaction in a different way. So the money that they deposited never actually bought them a car. So ne they never got it. But a couple of years later, the state decided that they can reimburse the money. But by the time that they got the money back, the inflation had taken its toll. So with the same money that they could buy a car on their wedding day, they were only able to buy a couch in the bedroom. And, you know, that kind of hurts. And they were still happy that they could get something back, which is interesting and a paradox. And honestly, when I first, first read about Bitcoin, I did not know this story because 
you don't really get to learn about your parents as adults until you grow up and they start telling you stuff. They treat you like a child up to, I guess, 25 or something. And once you get to meet them as adults, you start learning all of these stories about what happened. And also I have grand grandparents who before communism came around, they had small businesses. And by small businesses, I mean, I had a grand grandparent who was, was running an operation, a business with glass, just replacing glass windows. And just because he had employees, he had a couple of employees working for him. He was declared an enemy of the state and he had everything taken away from him. So in these two examples that actually happened in my family and are not singular, you can find lots of them in my country, I've described confiscation and inflation, two of the components that central banking and the state use against you. And once you figure this out and you understand how it works, Bitcoin makes a lot more sense to you and you realize, okay, this actually has a purpose in my life and I can learn from the previous generations that got screwed and actually try to do better with my life. I'm not saying that I am doing better because the challenges are different with every generation. And if my parents were able to access housing and get an apartment very easily, in my case, it's a lot more difficult. And I guess you all, all of you know that real estate is very expensive for our generation. And you basically have to get a loan and work your entire life to be able to get that. But, you know, I'm I'm still working on that. Well, something, so obviously, as you said, um, there's a plus side of, of Bitcoin, right, is that it's uh, relatively unsensible. And obviously, it's uh, to a degree, again, unseizable unless you're an absolute plank and you've stored it in like an American exchange when you're extorting people, <laughs> whatever it was that happened with the FBI seizing uh, Bitcoin. Um, but I guess one criticism that someone could have, I suppose, with Bitcoin is that on the censorable side of things, um, I've always felt that Bitcoin was uncensorable. And then along comes, uh, it was a couple of months back now, but we had uh, that um, American mining group. I think they said they weren't going to do it again, but they had that blank block, I think, to show. Yeah, Marathon. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. To prove that they could essentially censor and not accept transactions from certain individuals, should they wish. Um, that goes along with like FATF guidelines, I think it was. Uh, I say it's a little bit, my memory's not that great with it, but I guess what, because obviously what, what are your thoughts on that? I suppose, is that like a, do you see that as like a, a kind of a weakness potentially in Bitcoin? Or I suppose, do you think of like the other flip side where you can say, well, hey, miners can choose not to include a transaction, but there's always gonna be another miner that you know, may want to kind of thing. Like, I wonder what you thought on, on that when it, when it occurred. I think it's a major concern and we should all think about it. Because right now we trust in some miner around the world that we don't know. And if we were to define being a Bitcoiner, according to some developers, you're not a true Bitcoiner unless you also run your own mining rig. And I know it's not very practical and the energy costs usually are greater than your returns when you mine from home. But I'm actually looking these days into solutions that I can use to mine from home. I've actually found somebody from the USA who's producing home mining devices like ASICs, and they cost about $600 or something. They're not as powerful as ant miners and stuff like that, but at the same time, they consume very little power and they are quiet, which I think these two criteria are great. And if we as a community somehow discovered, and if there was a market for this, because somehow it, it makes me wonder why the Bitcoin project has grown so tremendously and yet you find ASICs so with such great difficulty. Like you should be able to access equipment to be able to participate in securing the network. And the fact that the mining is moving from China, which I think for all of their flaws and for all of the flaws of their government has treated, has treated Bitcoin mining a lot better than the USA right now. And the USA is trying to put too many regulations and everyone seems to be like a rent seeker who's trying to make money off of this new mining operation. So I think that we as a community should respond to this, not by blaming one part or the other, not by pressuring miners, because that can also be useful on the short term, but it relies on good faith. And you have to believe that everyone else is going to be a good actor. But if you really want to help the network, you should consider ways in which you can purchase a device that you run from home. 
and you also have to consider running it altruistically so not expecting any gains in the short term or the midterm and maybe that you're going to break even or make a profit sometime during the bull market but this is essential for us to secure the network and i hope that in the coming months the coming years we're going to have more devices even if they get marketed as lottery tickets or something so you mine and you might just win the big prize of a block reward if you're lucky but even if you do that it's still useful for the network and i know people who warm their homes with a6 that's not very practical if you can see it's very hot in here and at the time when we are doing the interview i have the sun which is on my side and that's why my face is red but i don't think heating is practical for all regions of the world there are parts of the world where it's very hot usually and the winter only lasts for a month or two but where you can actually heat your home that can be a good solution but for us we need something low powered quiet so that it doesn't distract attention and you can actually sleep in the same room and also good enough to contribute to the network security so i did not answer your question at all and i don't care much about marathon but i care about the bitcoin project and my approach to it is that instead of complaining of who does what we should take matters into our own hands and mine from home either solo which increases the difficulty and makes you very unlikely to actually mine a block it might take years or you can join some sort of mining pool which is ethical and switch from one to the other because for all of this mining centralization that we like to blame the fact that i can buy an S9 or something on the used market and mine with Ant Pool or F2 Pool both of them being from China it doesn't mean that i'm participating in chinese mining in any way it might mean that i'm helping them maximize their profits by increasing the hash rate that gets added to that pool but i'm mining from here in romania with a mine with an operation that actually takes place in china or the czech republic with slush pool or I guess there will be many more American companies that get into mining now. But my point is that we should all contribute to this just like we run nodes. I just wanted to ask, have you heard of the Stratum V2 uh mining protocol which is supposed to kind of make mining more efficient for individual miners who join pools and like make it more equitable? Yes, I think Matt Corallo contributed to that one. Or I think that's nice hash. either way i think stratum is already implemented in slush pool and they are working with it and it would be nice if more pools actually used it but this is part of the game theory you know if you don't if you participate in pool mining and you don't like that one pool does not implement something like taproot or something like stratum v2 then you can switch to the one that does i don't know why a lot of miners don't do this maybe that maybe solo miners and not solo they operate something from home and they join the network that's most likely to give them constant rewards and that's what they do so they just flock around the biggest player which might be f2 pool right now maybe that's what their consideration is because they want to break even with their electricity costs but at the same time we should also think about what's good for the network and Unfortunately, what's good for the network is not always the most profitable. Even though there's this idea that the Nakamoto consensus has solved it all, well, for example, running a node is not in any way beneficial for yourself monetarily. It helps you get privacy, it helps you validate your own transactions, so you get also sovereignty, but you don't make any money, so you do it at your own expense and you pay a price for the advantages that you get when you run your own node. and i see what mining kind of the same situation you should always also do it by yourself and you should also consider that when you mine and you actually find a block and even if you split the reward with some pool you're also getting some non kyc bitcoins so you're basically getting money that was not yet bought by michael seidler and kyc forever uh one thing that i see as a major problem 
in the world slash internet really at the moment um actually rather than just bitcoin is is censorship so you've got things like facebook and youtube with the demonetization and the blocking of and the deletion of accounts and, and lots more that can kind of you can actually ruin people's entire incomes uh Alex Jones, for example, you know, not, not that I necessarily agree with the guy, but, you know, lost pretty much everything. And yeah, Donald Trump being removed from Twitter and Facebook and multiple YouTubers. Um, I, I guess, are there any ways that you can see Bitcoin and like the people around it and the ecosystems that are built around it assisting with the sort of censorship issue that's going on in the internet as a whole right now? Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that, I suppose. Most people use Bitcoin in a custodial way. And that's an ugly truth that we need to fix. It's a truly permissionless and voluntary network. It's a project where you can contribute and you can help it and you can also help yourself. And the fact that most people buy their Bitcoins on eToro as ETFs, not ETFs, what do you call them? Mm. I, I don't get the abbreviation right now, but moving on, it, it's like paper money. It's like, I, I don't have a bill right here, but it's something that's supposed to be backed by some sort of asset that is hold, that is held by the custodian. So thinking about it, the fact that there are so many people and there are friends of mine who keep their coins on Kraken, for example, because they say they have such a good record with user funds and they were never hacked. And these two criteria are enough for them to give up on their sovereignty and say, yeah, but at least I have the advantages of being insured if something goes wrong. There are always trade-offs, so I can understand that. And some people search for the convenience and don't like to embrace sovereignty. But we should onboard more people in a way that is not or does not revolve around custodians because that's one major problem. Not only that it strips away all of the qualities of the Bitcoin network and the only advantage that a user might have at some point by using custodial Bitcoin is the number go up component because it's not censorship resistant as the custodian can decide to block a transaction or revert it. And it's not really a tool of sovereignty. It's more of a speculation. And if you only have the speculation part, to me, that's not really Bitcoin. That's more like, I don't know, gold ETFs or something like that. It's investing in the stock market, getting V-Bucks in Fortnite, get, getting gold in World of Warcraft. I think that's the best comparison, actually, with gold in World of Warcraft, because you can get it and the server can be shut down or there might be some administrator of the server who decides that you got it fraud fraud fraudulently or prevent you from selling it or decide that you stole it from some user. And that's not why Bitcoin exists. The network is supposed to provide all of these advantages that the fiat system does not have. And in order for every user to benefit from them, the user needs to run a node. 